Hey everybody, what's up? It's great to see you tonight. Actually, I can't see you at all, frankly, <laughs> but I presume you can see me and that is wonderful. It is great to be here with you tonight uh, on this live stream. Uh, I'm so glad that you're tuning in. I'm coming to you tonight from Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario. Um, I live in Kitchener, teach up here in Waterloo at Wilfrid Laurier University. And uh, I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us this evening to talk a little bit about concert percussion. Um, before we before we dive into this, I just want to take a moment, uh, you know, at the beginning of this to acknowledge the space and the land in which uh, this uh, I am occupying right now. Um, this is uh, the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Neutral peoples, um, and they were promised six miles on either side of the Grand River here uh, in Waterloo Region. And uh, this is actually stolen land from those indigenous peoples. And uh, I just wanted to recognize that, that, you know, this is drum month and we're celebrating this and so grateful to Long and McQuaid for, for having me come and do this tonight. Um, but really, really, um, you know, appreciating the opportunity to do that. But I just want to say that, um, you know, the drumming plays a really important role in Indigenous culture, both a sacred role and a social role. And, and that's true in, in Indigenous cultures from all over the world. And so I know that the tradition that I've been trained in um, is, is one that did the colonizing of those cultures. And so I just want to acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge my complacency in that throughout my training. And I want to promise that I'm going to do better. And I want to call on my fellow artists and colleagues and in the classical tradition to uh, to do better and, and work hard to, uh, to to work for not just inclusive inclusivity, uh, not just diversity, but equity for all artists and uh, just honor the, the different ways of understanding, but equally valuable ways of being and knowing and understanding. And so I just wanted to lead with that tonight and uh, just encourage you to think about the space that you're occupying wherever it is across the country that you might be tuning in from or around the world that you might be tuning in from and what the history of that land is. Um, and in the fact that, you know, not only the land is sometimes stolen, but also people are stripped of, of cultural resources and, and, um, and cultural practices like art and music. Listen, like I was saying, uh, I'm super glad to be a part of this. Um, uh, we're, this is a concert percussion workshop and you see a lot of snare drums in front of me. To be honest with you, if we were to do a, a concert percussion workshop on all of the concert percussion instruments, we would be doing like, you know, 15 or 20 of these throughout the next five or six months. There's so many instruments uh, in this field in which, uh, you know, we could discuss, we could talk about, and uh, we had to narrow it down somehow in some way. And so we chose tonight to talk basically about the, the snare drum and the concert approach to playing snare drum. Uh, that being said, we are going to take questions in the chat the whole night. So if you have a question about an instrument that's not the snare drum, uh, if I have one close by and I tried to make sure that there were a handful of these instruments close by, I will try to grab a, one and answer a question for you about that. Um, but regardless, if you have questions about the snare drum or as we go, happy to have you throw those in the chat. Happy to have your questions guide us tonight and, and guide our process. Um, you know, really want to make sure that whatever it is that you're hoping to get out of this tonight, that it's that I can be helpful for you as we do that. So, uh, yeah, happy to let the questions guide our evening. All right. So I, I want to before we get into playing and talking about playing and stuff and sticks and, and gear, I want to spend a little bit of time just just uh, elaborating a little bit on my uh, my philosophical approach to, to music making and how it pertains to, to percussion playing. And, and I think. One of the things that I want to, that is, that is most valuable, that's paramount when we're talking about playing concert percussion, or frankly, any, any musical instrument, is this notion that sound and sound quality is of the utmost importance. It's paramount, right? That is exactly what it is. It doesn't matter what the instrument is that we're playing. We're talking about the kind of sound that we're making. Music, music is sound. That's what it is, right? And so every other instrumentalist has to focus on that. And so often we forget that, that we should, you know, um, require that of our concert percussionists if we're educators or, you know, directors. Um, or as, as, as percussionists that we sometimes focus so much on the rhythm or all these, the notes, the dynamics, that we actually disregard the, the sound quality that's coming out of our instruments. These instruments are our voices. 
And it's really important that um, we create a unique voice that is true to us as artists. And so I want to encourage you to do that. I have a, a story to tell you about uh, one time we hosted uh, Evelyn Glennie here, famous, uh, world famous solo percussionist from Scotland. Uh, here at Laurier, we hosted her for a master class, and she had one of our students on stage, and she said, I'd like you to play this passage, and I'd like you to just, just play it for me again. And so the student plays it, and she says, that's wonderful and lovely. You played that like a percussionist. And then a little bit tongue-in-cheek, she goes, I'm now wondering if you could play it like a musician. And of course, chuckles make their way through the recital hall. And so the student thinks about it for a second, and then they play the passage again, and she says, that's wonderful, that's great, you play that like a musician. Now I'm wondering if you can play it like a creator of sound. And the student looked to the sky and really thought about that <laughs> for a minute. And then the thing that got played was incredible. In fact, like the, the, a hush fell over the whole room because when we push ourselves as artists to think about being creators of sound instead of outputters of musical information, um, then, then really, that's really where the expression happens, the magic happens, and the emotional communication happens, right? Where we can touch one another with our artistic practice. And so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to name that, and we're going to talk about sound tonight for sure. And I think the other thing I want to name for us is deep listening, which is tied to sound, right? We don't actually know what kind of sound we're making unless we're deeply listening to that sound as we practice, um, as we perform, or as we're listening to one another, or as we're listening to recordings um, in, in preparation for what it is that we might be playing. Uh, so I want to encourage us to, and by, by, the way, by the way, when I say, when I say deep listening, I, I mean like active, active listening, like not, not putting in not passive listening, <laughs> where we put something on and then we sweep or we swiffer or something, we clean windows. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself into the, the family man role here. This is what I do at my house. I put on music and then I clean and I do all this stuff. But what, <laughs> what I'm saying is that often we put music on in the background when we're doing something and then we do something else. And this is not the kind of listening I'm talking about. And I think often we're getting away from this in this digital age where it's really easy to have fast, sh uh, short snippets of things and our attention span can be really uh, short. And um, yeah, I think that's uh, a really, really important thing to remember, that to listen deeply and to listen deeply to musical genres and styles that are not the kinds of music that you play or like to listen to on a regular basis, but explore something. Look for something new. Find something new. Investigate another tradition. Because I can guarantee you that I come to you tonight as a learner, and I will come to these instruments and in my, my profession and my practice as a learner each and every day. And I guarantee you, you will learn something, even if that genre or style of music feels about as far away <laughs> from the thing that you're preparing to play uh, as it could possibly be. I want to guarantee you that you're going to learn something about understanding feel or musical style or genre or, or subdivision or just the ways in which uh, others approach particular concepts or music, music making. Um, you know, from their own tradition. And so I say all that to say this, which is that our concert percussion in, uh, inventory of instruments is vast and wide. And uh, the model that I try to live by is, you know, I gain all that information, I have it at my disposal, and then I basically say to myself, okay, Brennan, you got to make it fit. Make it fit. And I can't take credit for that. That comes to me uh, from former principal percussionist of the Toronto Symphony, John Rudolph, a wonderful friend, uh, mentor, teacher of mine. And um, he always used to say, make it fit. You know, so if you're playing uh, percussion in a, in a backing up a rock band in a rock symphony orchestra, you're going to play all of these instruments completely differently than you might play them, you know, at the back of a professional symphony orchestra playing Mahler or Shostakovich or something. You know, that we bring these different uh, styles and genres to all of these instruments. And frankly, to be honest with you, I, I can't make a living playing just concert percussion. I've been trained on all these instruments and we call it concert percussion, but I, I'm able to work in all these, you know, in the musical theater pit, there's different styles and genres of music that happen all through those musicals. 
Um, you know, there's rock music, there's all sorts of fusion music going on and popular and commercial music. And our instrument crosses all of those genre lines, right? That percussion is almost in a way universal. It's almost it's used in almost every type of music in some way, shape, or form. And so as much as it's called concert percussion, I want to encourage us to become percussionists of all walks of music and styles of music. And we do that by being open to learning, being open to listening from one another, engaging in deep listening, and then uh, you know, truly researching and investigating and obviously practicing our craft. All right, so let's talk a little bit. Speaking of sound and speaking of deep listening, let's talk about making sound on these snare drums. Concert snare drum, you know, sort of the instrument of the concert band or the symphony orchestra used so often in the literature. And, uh, you know, I just want to thank tonight, you know, right off the top here, I want to thank Sean LaFriends and Mark Tarek from Pearl Adams Drums and Concert Percussion for, uh, for sponsoring tonight's live stream. Huge shout out to both of you. Really appreciate your support here tonight. And um, I just want to go from there and say, basically, these drums are the best drums. I, these are all pearl snare drums here. And I play all these drums because I think they're fantastic drums. They sound great. And they offer such a huge uh, palette. Of, in, of sounds that you can, you can, there's so many different kinds of concert drums and different uh, designs, different materials, different sizes that you can really get whatever it is that you need. So I'm gonna walk you through this. I have uh, here, uh, I think these four drums. And uh, we, were, we were testing the live stream earlier. Matt pointed out that I, I set them up in pitch order, which was not intentional, but that is, that is what I did. <laughs> And, and I think a little bit in size, too. So we'll start over here on my right. This is a uh, 14 by 5 beaded brass Pearl Philharmonic snare drum. Uh, fantastic drum. You know, um, it's, it's a bright, like, really focused kind of a sound. Uh, cuts a lot, uh, but in really good projection and really good clarity. It sounds like this. Okay, beautiful drum. Love this drum. This is one of my drums. Uh, subsequently here, I have my other drum. This is my 14 by 6 and a half, um, maple uh, drum, uh, Pearl Philharmonic maple drum. And uh, this is a wonderful drum. I'm just noticing the snares are a little loose there, so just tighten them up. But this is a wonderful drum. Uh, you know, rich, warm sound. The, the six and a half gives this, this nice, beautiful depth of sound. It's a dark, sort of full response from the drum. Beautiful sound, sounds like this. So I love this drum. This is a perfect pair for me, these drums, because I have this beautiful dark, you know, warm drum, uh, wooden drum, and then I have this brighter uh, beaded brass drum that cuts through and it has a little bit more clarity. So depending on how, uh, you know, what situation I'm, I'm, I'm in, I might use uh, one or the other. Sometimes I use both of these drums depending on what I'm playing um, in different passages. So there's no, no shame in setting up more than one drum if, if you need it. a different sound, right? Because you're going after that sound no matter what. If you need a different sound, that's paramount. Okay, so these are my two drums. A couple other drums we have for you here. This is a symphonic drum. Um, lovely, wonderful drum, originally designed specifically for this for the symphonic concert stage. Uh, this one has a snare strainer on it where you can control all, th all like each one on and off individually. I'm going to get to the snare strainer on, on the Philharmonic drums in a second, but this strainer on the symphonic drum, um, these, these throws are individual, so you can turn, you know, one off, two off, you can have one on, so you have complete control over the snare response. So here's the symphonic drum. Okay, and then if I dump to these snares, it sounds quite different. Okay. You can hear not a lot of clarity with that combination, um, you know, and that's just because the two that I dumped happen to be the ones that provide the most clarity. But I just so that you get a good sense of how the, how different you can make the sound just by turning one or two of the individual snare strainers uh, controls on, on or off. Wanted to give you that example. And then there's um, 
this is frankly one of my favorite drums. This is one of the drums we own here at the school. This is a 14 by eight beaded brass drum. So same material as my five inch drum over here. But this 14 by eight drum is a monster. It's a beast. You do not have to work very hard at all to play loud on this drum. And, um, you know, still like a highly focused sound, really, really great projection. Darker for sure than the, than the, than the shallower drum because of the depth to it. It's, it's an incredible drum. Love that drum. That's a fantastic drum. It really is great. So hopefully you can hear the difference there coming in a little bit. Um, and just just absolutely loving the the just the options here uh, on these drums. And just a reminder that if you have any questions about any of these drums, you can throw them in the chat. I also know that Sean did mention, Sean the Friends from uh, Pearl Adams Drums and Concert Percussion said that he might, might try to hop on the live stream tonight. So Sean, if you're here tonight, shoot me a message in the chat. That's great. Certainly understand if you can't make it, but if you're here, that's awesome. Would love to uh, would love to know you're here, and certainly I know that you'd be happy to probably answer some questions too about about gear. So, okay, cool. So um, this is moving on. I'm just seeing a couple of questions come in in the chat here. So just give me a quick second to to read them so I know what you're asking me, and then we can see if I can be helpful to you. Uh, all right, let's see here. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm seeing this question here from Sue, Sue Street. So Sue, you're talking about a piccolo snare drum and you happened to, uh, I don't know if you saw it uh, hiding in the back here, um, but I do have a piccolo drum here. This is a uh, Pearl Philharmonic uh, 13 by four, I believe. Yeah, 13 by four, 13 by three inches even possibly. Um, Pearl Philharmonic piccolo snare drum. Uh, and your your question, I believe, is about tuning the drum uh, in terms of whether I tune it differently, the piccolo drum versus the other drums. The answer is yes, I do. Um, I tend to shoot for about an A natural on most of my concert snare drums. And um, you know that's just, again, I should preface all of the information I'm going to say tonight by saying this, which is that I only know how to do this stuff from the wonderful teachers who were willing to, <laughs> to share their knowledge uh, with me. And certainly then I, I took that and explored it and, and made it my own. Um, and so th the way I do things is not the way everybody needs to do stuff. There's lots and lots of different ways to do it. But I, for me, um, you know, what you're going to hear tonight is my approach and the way that I, I go about playing these instruments and thinking about sound. So, yeah, to answer your question, I tend to tune these drums at about an A natural. The piccolo I might crank up to, say, a B flat, just to get a little bit, um, you know, uh, a little bit more clarity out of the drum. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how I tend to proceed. If I need to have a little bit more of a brighter, a little bit more articulate sound, I'm going to, I'm going to tune it up to B flat. Sometimes though, depending on the piccolo, you don't need to crank it, um, because it's so small already that the A itself, you do need to give the drum some, some breath so that we still hear the, the tone of the drum and we don't actually only hear snare articulation. We do want to hear some body to that sound as well. So hopefully that's helpful. And just the second part of your question here, I'm thinking I'm seeing here about, um, about heads. Yeah, so I use two different kinds of heads um, typically. Let me just put this piccolo down here. So two different kinds of heads I usually use on my concert snare drums. I'm usually using either uh, a Remo Renaissance drum, uh, a head, excuse me. So a Remo Renaissance, like a Diplomat Renaissance head. Um, and that is the head that was designed by Remo to sort of simulate or mimic calf skin. Uh, so that's this head right here. It's sort of a, a cloudy uh, head. Okay. Uh, so either the Remo Renaissance head or uh, I would use like a coated head. So the coated head, um, you know, this is like a, 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 this would be a white head. And for me, that's an Evans, uh, an Evans orchestral staccato. Okay, so the Evans Orchestral Staccato is a bit of a, um, it's, it's one of those heads that's coated, but then it has a, a, a damper ring on the underside of the head all the way around that helps to just focus the sound a little bit and pull a little bit of the overtones out of it to provide a little more clarity. 
So those are the two heads. Those are my two go-to heads. I typically have the orchestral staccato on my six and a half inch drum, which is not what you see tonight. <laughs> but I typically have that there. And then I typically have the Renaissance on my uh, five inch drum. But I will interchange those however I need to, depending on what it is that I'm playing. Um, and in terms of that, that muting ring that's on the underside of the Evans orchestral staccato head, um, you know, I almost always play snare drum with some form of mute, or at least um, I have a mute available if I need it. And that's just, you know, if so often when we get these drums in tune, there's that as we move off the center of the drum to play, we can get that high overtone. So if I take my little mute off here, I'm not sure if you can hear on Zoom this, this high ping kind of coming across. Um, so when I get that drum in tune, this, this, you know, I just have a little moon gel. Moon gels, they come now in clear. Imagine that, look at that, you can't even see it. I gotta hold it up. It's like a transparent, it's like these are one of the most interesting materials I've ever seen in my entire life. You can wash them and reuse them and stuff. These are moon gels, they come in clear, they come in blue, the original moon gel blue. Um, you know, but I, you can get them at your local Long and McQuaid, I'm sure, I know you can. I've gotten uh, many a pack of moon gel at my local Long and McQuaid. So, uh, yeah, the moon gels are great, and I have those at my disposal. So I can put one on the drum, I can put five on the drum, I can put, you know, can do whatever I need to to get the drum to sound the way it is that I want it to sound. So, if I take that moon gel off, that overtone, the moon gel dries it up a bit. So the Evans Orchestral Staccato has that tone, uh, that, that basically that tone ring on the underside. Um, it is there to sort of help accomplish the same kind of thing. Frankly, I end up usually using a moon gel anyways along with that head, but it's supposed to help with a little bit uh, of that, and it does, frankly, it's a little bit better. One tip while I'm thinking about it on the Evans Orchestral Staccato is um, when you have to play near the edge of the drum, so as we play on the snare drum, as we, if we want to get a little bit quieter, uh, and we, we want to maybe move towards the edge of the drum. So as you move towards the edge of the drum, that ring is, you know, maybe about an inch or so into the, into the head. So you can't get as close to the edge because now you have two ply, you have double the thickness on the head there. You don't want to play over top of that. It's going to change the snare response. It's going to change the sound. So what I've done in the past is I've actually, before I put the head on, the orchestral staccato head on, I actually cut the tone ring out of the spot where I'm gonna play near the edge of the drum, and then I put it on. So I have the tone ring basically all the way around, but between the two lugs and the two tension rods where I'm gonna play near the edge of the drum, I cut that tone ring out so that I have the same single you know, head as I have in the middle, I have near the edge, so I get the same kind of response. All right, hopefully that's helpful to you. Hopefully that's helpful to you. Um, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. All right, so these are the drums. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about snares and snare strainers. So uh, my drums I bought before Pearl came out with their brand new snare strainer, which I believe launched this year on their Philharmonic drums. Uh, so they have a, a new updated snare strainer, but these are the silent snare strainers um, on this drum. So I have one lever on the Philharmonic drums and I can individually control with three separate knobs here, I can individually control each of these snares. And the snares on the bottom here, I have a heavy yellow coated cable for my loud playing. I got a stainless steel cable uh, for my quiet playing. And then this older drum uh, with the snares, I like the original coil for my, my, my medium playing. So I know that some of the drums now come with the snappy wire uh, and that's awesome too, certainly. Um, you know, nice and crisp and clear. Um, so those are the three options. You can swap, swap them out. Uh, you, can, you can put whatever three snares on there you want. You can control each of them individually. One lever on, and then a, a total control. You can tighten all at once or loosen all at once uh, with the knob on the back side. One of the things I love about that strainer is that it's less complicated for my brain. <laughs> Some of the other drums on the market, they have like a zillion controls on the drum and you got to hit three buttons and then remember to turn this one off and then remember to turn that one on. And frankly, when I'm in the middle of performing, I just want to, I want to go on and I want to play. And uh, that's just the way my brain works. So um, flexibility is great for me. Too much flexibility gets complicated. So there we go. There we go. All right. Just going to grab a little drink here and then we're going to get talking about uh, 
you know, playing a little bit, playing rolls and sticks. Yeah, we have a draw tonight too. I want to just remind everybody that we have a, a, a draw. So if you email Connolly at long mcquadecom if you email Connolly at long mcquadecom you uh, will be entered into a draw to win a Pearl t-shirt. So we're thrilled about that. I want to thank Pearl for sending those t-shirts along. And uh, yeah, so Connolly at long mcquadecom uh, for a chance to win a, a free Pearl t-shirt on the draw. All right. Just uh, just checking in. I'm seeing more questions coming, which is great. Happy to have your questions guide our time tonight. So really, really glad for this. Just uh, having a chance to take a look at what's going on here. Uh, just a couple questions about hoops. Um, yeah, so it says here, do you have, do you prefer die cast hoops or triple flange hoops? This is coming in, I think, from Sue. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I would say that I, I tend to prefer the single flange hoops. Um, that's sort of the way that I, I tend to go for me. Um, frankly, uh, I haven't thought too much about hoops because when I landed on these drums, uh, they just sound great with the hoops they come with. So, uh, you know, I've, I've had a chance to play the different drums and, um, you know, they, I, I've thought the least probably about hoops. I think about snares, I think about heads, I think about sticks, I think about the tension of the head and the tuning and the snares. And certainly the hoop play, it makes a difference here, but I would say that the, the single flange hoops for me uh, tend to be the way that I go. I don't, I don't really mess often with the, with the construction or the design that I get the drum with when it first shows up, if that makes sense. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, I don't have more of an opinion than that, I think is what I'm trying to say. So um, yeah, great question. Cool. All right. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about playing. So uh, the idea tonight is to give you a little bit of an opportunity to, to think about what it's like to play a snare drum roll. And so I'm going to walk us through that from our concert approach here. Uh, we're going to think about that uh, in terms of how we can execute that, give you a couple of exercises and ways to think about a couple things to practice. And then from there, um, you know, we can, we can, see what it's like to apply it in a in a particular uh, instance. So I'm going to work with this maple drum here in front of me. So like I said, this is not the only way to play snare drum roll by any means, but this is the way that's worked for me over the years. So we need to begin with what is the purpose of a roll? It's a great question, a really important fundamental question before we start playing something. What's the point? What's the purpose of this? Well, the purpose of a roll, in my opinion, is that it's the, it, the goal is to create a sustained sound, a continuous sustained sound. And so uh, that's what we're after here, especially in the concert setting, okay? So if we think through the Percussive Arts Society uh, rudiments, there's different kinds of roles that are listed as the rudiments there in those roles. And so the three main kinds of roles that we talk about um, are as follows. We have single stroke roles, we have double stroke roles, and then we have multiple bounce stroke roles, sometimes referred to as a buzz roll or a closed roll or a concert role, okay? So I'm gonna briefly touch on the first two so we understand what they are, and then we're gonna spend most of our time on the third one tonight, because that's the one that's applicable in our concert setting. So a single stroke role is simply a role where I'm trying to create a sustained, continuous sound by alternating my hands back and forth, left and right, right and left, as quickly as I can, or as makes sense for that particular instrument. A single stroke roll is not a roll that we try to use on the concert snare drum to sustain the sound because it's not, we could never play fast enough to sustain that sound. We don't get enough natural resonance from the snare drum to sustain that sound. So the single stroke roll is a, is a roll that we would use on the timpani, for example, anything that has some more natural resonance to it and we can just keep the sound going. So timpani, concert bass drum, uh, suspended cymbal, these are the kinds of instruments where we're gonna play single stroke rolls. Okay, so that's, we'll set that aside for now. We don't need to worry about that. The double stroke roll is absolutely a, a roll that we're gonna play on the snare drum. And the double stroke roll is a roll that uh, is often used in one of the two main styles of snare drumming. So our main styles of snare drumming, we have what's called traditional or rudimental style snare drumming. Its history dates back into the military, okay? And then branching off of that and then becoming its own style is what we call 
sort of the concert or orchestral style of snare drumming. And that's, you know, what we're basically going to be focusing on tonight because that's the kind of playing that we use uh, in the symphony orchestra and the concert band in a concert setting. Okay, so the double stroke roll, we basically are going to reserve for playing rudimental solos in contest. You might see that used quite often, in fact, almost all the time in marching band and in drum line. Um, okay, but, and you, you will see it sometimes in concert settings if, if the ensemble is playing a march or something like that. Um, then you, you might hear that as well. Um, but otherwise, we tend to go uh, with the multiple bounce rule. So the double stroke rule, just so we're clear, I'm going to throw my hand one time at the drum, and I'm going to get two rebounds. So here's a regular stroke. <laughs> Left hand. <laughs> now, that's a single. I get one for one. My double stroke, I'm going to get two for one. So I'm getting two rebounds for one. I can speed that up. And I can get my double stroke roll. It's a sustained snare drum sound, but you can hear a little bit more clarity in it, a little bit more articulation. It sounds a little bit more like a machine gun. It's really, really, you know, it's an articulate sustained sound, if that makes sense. All right, so this is my double stroke roll. So we're going to set that aside as well. And now we're going to focus on the third kind of roll. So this ro roll has multiple names. It has like aliases, uh, like lots and lots of aliases. So it's known as the concert roll. It's known as the multiple bounce roll, the multiple bounce stroke roll. The buzz roll is probably one that you've heard most often. Also known as the closed roll in contrast to the open roll, which is another name for the double stroke roll. Okay, so what I want to do when I play multiple bounce rolls, I want to try to get as many bounces as possible when I'm first starting out and learning this thing. I want to get as many bounces as possible as I can, multiple bounces from each stroke. So my single strokes, I get one for one. My double strokes we just talked about, I get uh, a twofer. My multiple bounce stroke, I want to get so many, I might even lose count. So. Okay, and I'm getting lots there. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's, there's so many in there, okay, that it's almost an indeterminate number. So that's the first thing you want to figure out how to do. So you've, you need to figure out how to do that by, by first understanding how your arm is going to get there, what the, what the uh, pathway is going to be for your arm and your wrist to the drum. So I'm just going to pull this in. Here we go what your pathway is going to be to the drum. Because you want to make sure that you're replicating that every single time. So making sure this arm is doing exactly what you want it to be doing. Same pathway. I'm thinking uh, a little bit of, of arm. The arm moves as a byproduct of my wrist throwing the stick. So as I get louder and I play faster, I'm going to end up using my elbow a little bit as a hinge. Um, and we kind of get this chicken wing effect. But for now, lots of rebounds, as many as you can get. And you're going to practice that one hand at a time. So here's a few rights. Nice and relaxed. So you're just dropping the stick into the head, and you're letting it do the work. You're letting it rock back and forth over your fulcrum. Some of you might be using a two-point two fulcrum approach, approach. That could be your thumb and your index finger. Uh, some of you might also add your middle finger in there for a three-point fulcrum approach. Either of those are fine, but you want to just let that stick rock back and forth over that fulcrum. So what we're listening for here is uh, the same kind of sound in each hand, and not only the same quality of sound, but ideally the same kind of uh, decay of rebounds in each of these. Okay, so what we're thinking about here is uh, what I call buzz stroke density, which is how close together are all of those rebounds? Are they far apart? Ba 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 ba, or do they happen all really quickly together? Are they far apart? Or do they happen all really quickly together? Okay, so I want to I want to be able to get the same thing from each one of those hands. So one way to practice that is actually to 
to do them both at the same time. So I could do this from the same height in the same way, I should get the same thing. Sometimes it helps to turn the snares off if you're doing this. You can hear this a little bit more clearly. You'd have to turn all five of your snares off though. Hang on a second. Excuse me. <laughs> Otherwise it doesn't work. Let's see. That's better. There we go. I was a little rattled. There we go. So you want that decay to be the same. Once you know you have that the same, again, we're not worrying about how many times the stick is, is bouncing yet. We can talk about that later. As long as you can make it, then you're going to start playing that individually, hand to hand, right and left, making sure that the sound is the same. So. Okay. In fact, frankly, I practice my rolls a lot with the snares off because if I can make a good sounding roll with the snares off, when the snares kick on, it's even better. So th there's a lot, not very much forgiveness when you just hear the, the, the drum without the snares. All right. So all of that to say, uh, the next step is the overlap. Okay, so I got my rebound, my multiple bounce stroke that's happening in my right hand, lots and lots of rebounds. Okay, indeterminate amount as much as I can, as long as I as possible. Got them happening in my left hand. I got them happening the same way, kind of at the same decay rate. Okay. Now I want to start to make sure that I'm overlapping them. If I don't overlap them, I could have the best individual hand buzz strokes in the world, but there's going to be a gap and I'm not going to have that continuous sound. So they need to overlap. So I get my right hand. And before my right hand is actually fully done rebounding and, and, and buzzing, I'm going to begin my left so that there's no gap. So. Okay, so you need to practice that for quite a while because it's actually a bit... If you're not used to it, starting your next hand while your other hand is finishing something can be more complicated than you think because we're so used to stopping what we're doing in order to begin the next thing. Okay, so I got the overlap going and then I'm going to gradually speed that up, making sure that I don't lose lots and lots of strokes and making sure that I'm still overlapping. I got my multiple bounce roll, okay? So that's the pr initial premise of how we want to go ahead and set that up, all right? So I'm just going to take a quick break here to see if there's any questions. I want to remind you to email. Uh, if you want to be entered in the draw for a Pearl t-shirt, it's Connolly at long mcquadecom So email Connolly at long mcquadecom if you want to be entered in the draw for a Pearl t-shirt. And I'm seeing some questions come in the chat here. Um, yeah, look, listen, I'm seeing a question here from Brad from Saskatoon. Brad, hello in Saskatoon uh, from, from here in Waterloo. Uh, exercises to develop the concert buzz roll. Yeah, we're, we're talking it. So I think we just, um, you know, we're going through this here. We're walking through it. This is the first of a few exercises. And then um, certainly I have a couple of other things that I want to throw your way that are going to hopefully be helpful as you continue to develop that a little bit. All right. Um, other questions? Let's see here. Um, I'm seeing a question here from, yeah, this looks like a Brawl Life question. Do you play in a band? Um, so, so the answer to that question is sorta. Um, as a concert percussionist, uh, I frankly think, I usually classify myself as not cool enough to play in a band, frankly. Um, but, <laughs> 
but no uh so i i do uh, work as a mostly as a freelance musician here in southwestern ontario and i i play a lot with uh classical symphony orchestras but also do uh work um pretty regularly behind a band i will say um there's the jeans and classics rock symphony based out of london ontario and um and so the rock band that plays all sorts of different shows uh, and cover shows, uh, I play in the orchestra behind that ensemble as well. And actually, I just have to say this out loud because it's the pandemic and we just need a little bit of celebration of arts, but we got news today um, that the, the theater in London has launched their 2021, 2022 season and they have earmarked three dates for us to return and play concerts starting in January. So fingers crossed that everybody stays healthy and uh, we can get back on stage and making music together. But we're pretty excited about that. Um, that was a highlight of my day to see that that's coming. So um, yeah, stay with it, everybody. We're gonna be back to making music uh, sooner, uh, sooner than we all think, hopefully, assuming that we all stay the course. All right, cool. Another question here I'm seeing from Sue, just a question about matched grip here versus uh, presumably traditional grip. I'm just skimming your question here. So the question is, do you tend to use matched grip primarily for your concert work or do you change up between traditional grip and matched grip? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I would say that I was trained in the, in the era, I think this has sort of evolved, I would say that half generation to generation before me, um, they likely would have been taught and played traditional. I was just never taught to play traditional. Uh, my, my line of teachers, at least where I first started my snare drum playing, uh, I, don't, I don't play traditional grip. Um, one of the things that I that I do know about playing traditional grip is that if you do play traditional grip when you're playing concert snare drum, the recommendation I have is that you tilt the drum. Yeah, and that for those of you that play traditional, I imagine that will make sense to you. Um, but traditional grip was always uh, there because, sorry, has always existed the way that it exists because drums would have been worn over the shoulder on parade. Um, you know, uh, in the in the military, I guess perhaps even if you go back far enough in battle, there would have been drums slung over the shoulder, and so we would have had traditional grip. And so, the, because the drum was on an angle, we needed to to adjust the way that we we hold the sticks uh, to make that happen. So the drum would have been on an angle like this. Playing match grip like that is actually quite awkward, right? So. Traditional was what it was because the drum was worn over the shoulder. So now that we got technology and we got concert snare drum stands and we can put the drum flat, match grip makes a lot of sense for a, a, a flat drum. So I will say this, which is that if you're gonna, if you do play traditional, you're gonna play in the on a concert snare drum stand. I mean, certainly do what works for you. But my experience has been in the conversations I've had with my colleagues who do play traditional grip that you're going to want to tilt that drum because it's just going to probably feel more natural to you playing the drum on an angle. Okay. Um, this is what the thing I always find a little bit goofy about some of the drum cores and lines in the, in the U S and I, I don't know very much about it. So I will, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't mean to be ignorant, I guess is what I'm saying, but the, a lot of the drum cores will play traditional, but the drums are flat with their harnesses. And then it's, it's hard. I feel like that could be just, um, Physically, you know, from my physiology coming at the drum and the instrument, I, I might not feel as relaxed or as comfortable behind the instrument. So, yeah, for me, I'm a mass grip player. Always have been, probably always will be, frankly. Um, yeah, so there you go. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and it's, oh, I'm going to take maybe a couple more questions and then we'll continue on here with some of our, uh, some of our concert role conversations. There's another question coming in here from, from Brad. Um, so you had a question here. Is there an orchestral snare drum book series that you would recommend? So you're, you, then you name a few options here. So Delaclues, Peter, Cerrone. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, in terms of uh, the short answer to those books is yes. <laughs> we use lots of those books. Uh, I, I tend to work students through Cerrone and Delaclues. I was worked through that myself. Um, both the method book of Delid Clues and his 12 etudes, his Deux Etudes. Um, another a couple of books that I've discovered lately that pertain specifically to the role, I was going to talk about this later, but we're talking about it now, so I'm going to just name it now. Um, there's two books. There's a book called The Modern Concert Snare Drum Roll by William James. And, and that's a great book that has lots of different exercises in there about developing the concert snare drum roll. Um, talks about you know releasing the role, 
A few of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, I think, um, are expanded on in that book. So that's a nice book that's helpful. If you found tonight helpful to you, you might want to go ahead and take a look at that book. And another great book is a is a book by uh, Emile Chole called The Role. Simply, it's called The Role. That's it. Um, and it's a, a quite a thin book, but there's lots and lots of exercises in there. Um, and they're all geared to working on the role at different dynamic levels and just, um, you know, understanding different kinds of role meters and role bases. And we're, we're going to talk about that in a second, too. So so both of those things, uh, both of those those texts, I think, are really helpful in supporting this particular live stream workshop, if that's helpful to you. Um, but yeah, I would say that's for sure. And then we certainly use Delaclues and Cerrone. Not so much Peters. Uh, younger students, if you're working with high school students, I would say Whaley is a great place to go as well. He's got both the beginner and the intermediate books uh, and the advanced books. He kind of has them leveled out. So that's helpful, Garwood Whaley. Um, some of you might use Garwood Whaley's rhythm book for all of your students. If you are if you have a you know, teach instrumental music or something, he has a rhythm book that um, is for all instrumentalists. So anyways, that's, that's a couple of those uh, options for you for sure. Uh, and just last thing here, I'm just, I need, I have, my eyes are getting, let's see. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Here's a question from Randy. So Randy, your question is any recommended tuning aids, like how do you target the A natural you tune to, like, do you use a drum dial or other? Yeah. I, my philosophy is I'm not proud. If something is going to help me, I'm going to use it because it's a tool that's in my tool belt. So yeah, I absolutely use a drum dial. Um, you know, I have an approach for tuning the drum in, in terms of actually like putting on a new head um, really quickly. I, you know, I get it all lined up. Make sure you mark the counter hoop when you take it off in case it's warped at all uh, or the drum has fallen and been bent in any sort of way, shape or form. Like you want to make sure the counter hoop goes on exactly where it came off. Otherwise, it, it might not pull evenly. So make sure you mark the counter hoop in the shell where you take it off, the little small piece of tape, non-marking tape. Take it off, pop the head off, clean it, clean the inside of the drum, take anything out, get the dust out, vacuum it, whatever it is you need to do <laughs> to the drum. And then uh, set your new head, set the counter hoop back on, lining up the markings that you've made so you know it's going back on in the right spot. And then I finger tighten. So basically I go all the way around with these tension rods and I get them as tight as I can with my fingers. And then once they're finger tight, I get my key and I line my key up so it's visually the same for me all the way around. And usually I use two keys, so I'm opposite one another. So I'll line them both up so that they are parallel to one another. My two keys look like this. And every single one of those tension rods looks the same. So now I'm basically uh, like within, if I'm finger tight and I've just made a couple of adjustments, then I go exactly evenly all the way around, bringing it up. Uh, in terms of the pitch, uh, yeah, I, it's usually just by trying to find the A from a reference A. Um, I don't have a, a number on the drum dial that I go to that is always A or something like that. Um, but when I get close to A in the ballpark and I'm pretty happy, I don't want to go too far, um, then I drop the drum dial on and I try to even it up. Uh, and then that's when I'm going around one at a time trying to even it up. Um, so that's, that's my approach. Um, to the to the tuning, it tends to work out pretty well, especially if the head's brand new and the drum's in really good shape. Um, and in terms of just you know every once in a while, just checking in, I have no issue just taking down even if you go to one tension rod, you know just loosen it off a little bit so you can really hear the pitch at that tension rod drop. This is what the snare is off. Beep, boom, 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 boom. And then don't be afraid to play the drum as you bring it back up. Sometimes it's really, it's a lot easier, sorry, is what I'm trying to say, to hear the pitch of the drum from underneath. Just like when we're tuning timpani, it's a lot easier to hear the, the pitch from when you come from underneath. And especially if you have more of a gap, right? So if you create that gap from the, from the target pitch, then you really can hear yourself slide up into the right note, and that's a lot easier to find than if you're really, really close. Sometimes it's the really close ones that are hard to tell if we're, if we're there or not. So yeah, hopefully that's helpful to you, Randy. Certainly we can talk more about that. I should say this, which is that if, if any questions come up from tonight or you think about something and you want to get a hold of me and ask me a question about something, I would love to, to dialogue with you and support you in that and answer your question and connect with you and have a Zoom or whatever. So that's just, yeah, I'm, I'm really passionate about that stuff and connecting with folks. So you can always send me an email. 
Uh, it's B Connolly, B C O N N O L L Y, and that's at W L U for Wilfrid Laurier University dot C A. Cool. A reminder speaking of emails, a reminder to email Connolly at long uh to enter into the draw for a free Pearl t shirt. All right, let's get back to playing a little bit. So we got our basic concert snare drum roll happening with the really long buzz strokes. And now the thing that I want to talk about are the factors that change that approach, because there are factors that change that approach. That doesn't work all the time, okay? So I want, I want us to understand something, which is that when we need to play louder, okay, our sticks need to come higher off the drum, okay? And often we need to move our hands faster. And if that's true, then I can't go for my 12 or 13 rebounds per stroke because I don't have enough time before I have to play the next one. So now I want to start playing around with how many rebounds am I actually getting in each of those multiple bounce strokes. So here's my single, remember? Here's my double. Here's my multiple bounce. Now. I actually want to work on being able to control getting anywhere from one, which we already know I can do, thankfully, to at least six. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, and I want to know exactly how many I'm playing. Left hand, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay. So this time now, I'm not just going for lengthy, 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 long, 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 but I'm playing a certain number of rebounds in each hand, okay? That's really important because there's a relationship between how many of those rebounds I'm able to cram in and the dynamic I'm playing, okay? So the louder I'm going to play, the higher my sticks need to be, the fewer of those rebounds I can get in because I'm moving my hands faster, okay? So... Uh, all of that to say, if I start to take them away, okay, I would say I usually play about four or five on the quiet rolls. So that's about four or five. Okay. And as I get louder, I want to eventually work my way to the optimal number, which is three, okay? And this is what we call the triple bounce. So that book that I was speaking about, the Emile Scholle book called The Roll, he has, uh, at the beginning of the book, it says, every single exercise in this book, I want you to do three ways. I want you to play, uh, yeah, basically he says, I want you to play uh, it like singled, so that you can just work on your single strokes. And then he says, I want you to play a double stroke roll, Oh, excuse me, that's not right. He says, I want you to play double stroke roll, I want you to play multiple bounce roll, and then I want you to play a triple bounce roll. Those are the three ways. Obviously, it's called a roll, the roll. So the three ways he talks about, let me just say that again so that it's clear for you. Here's, he says, I want you to play each of these exercises three ways. One, a double stroke roll. Two, a multiple bounce roll. And three, a triple bounce roll. So the triple bounce roll is a type of multiple bounce roll, but it's as few as we can play before we get back to double, right? So here's my double. Okay, then all of a sudden, I want to try to get three. So if I start working on three in each hand, and eventually if I speed that up, you should hear triplets, like da ga da gi da ga da ga da gi da ga da ga from coming. Okay, that's the fewest number of rebounds I can get in each hand, but now I can get my sticks way higher off the drum, and I can move my hands faster because I'm not waiting for all like five, six, seven rebounds to finish. So that allows me to play with my optimal volume. So. So I'm going to try to switch back and forth between the double 
and the triple bounce. It's subtle, but you'll hear that it sounds, all of a sudden it sounds like a multiple bounce roll. It sounds like a concert roll instead of that sort of machine gun-like, military-like sound. So... Okay, so all I'm trying to get out of each one of those those multi, those strokes, those multiple bounce strokes, is three when I'm playing louder. So my sticks are high, and I can get three per, per multiple bounce stroke. It's called the triple bounce. It's what allows me to play a lot louder. So the relationship, this is actually comes from a really wonderful, really valuable piece of information um, that was passed on to me that dates back to a, a wonderful man named Alan Abel, a former percussionist in the Philadelphia Orchestra, inventor of the suspension bass drum stand, concert bass drum stand, invention, inventor of the world's famous, most famous triangle, which is an isosceles triangle, um, concert triangle. Alan Abel was an incredible human and an incredible musician, and he has this amazing roll chart. Um, so if you just search, you know, Alan Abel roll chart, on Google, you're gonna find it. Um, but basically what it talks about is there's these four factors. There's dynamics, there's tempo, there's stick height, and there's number of rebounds. And there's a re the relationship you know, is inverse. So as the dynamic goes up, your stick height goes up, which means the number of bounces you can get in each hand has to go down. So if I'm playing quieter, I can move my hands a little bit slower. My, I'm gonna be closer to the drum, and that means I can play four, five, six rebounds. Okay. As the dynamic goes up, my sticks are gonna be up. I gotta move my hands. Uh, I'm gonna have less rebounds in each of my strokes because I'm higher off the drum. And because I don't have as many opportunities to overlap, because I need to keep the overlap, I got to move my hands faster because I only got three strokes in each hand that I have a chance or that I have a chance of overlapping, right? Those rebounds. So, obviously, I have to move my hands faster. I can't overlap. So I can play slower here. So I can work my way from quiet to loud to quiet. And what I'm changing there as I change the dynamic is my stick height. I'm getting less rebounds in each hand and I'm moving my hands faster as I get louder because I gotta maintain that overlap. Hopefully that's making sense to you. So let's see if we can put this into context a little bit. So let's all picture in our heads or maybe you can find it if you want. I don't know if you have, some of you might have sticks in the pad out tonight. That's great if you're working on stuff or a drum, amazing. But I just wanna take one half note. That's it. We're just gonna talk about one half note right now. And the half note has three slashes on it, which is gonna indicate for us that we wanna play a roll, a sustained continuous sound. And because this half note is written in a concert band piece of music, we know that the genre and the style is telling us that we're not gonna play a double stroke roll, we're gonna play a multiple bounce, buzz roll, closed roll, concert roll, okay? So I have my half note. And I've learned now what the relationship is for me in terms of my rebounds, practicing each of these individual, um, you know, rebounds in each hand, I should say. So what I'm thinking about the stroke density, how many rebounds am I getting in each hand? I've worked on that. I understand what the relationship is. Here's a little bit of a simpler way to approach it, I think, sometimes. So that's the complexity of it, but sometimes we, we can go back and think about a, a more simple way. So if we take the half note, all I want us to consider right now are what rhythmic options equal a half note. Because in order for me to sustain that roll, I have to be moving my hands in a rhythm, okay? And this is what, this is what we call metering the roll. And when we meter the roll, it allows us to not get lost, okay? So if I have a half note, I know that I have, for example, eight sixteenth notes, or six eighth note triplets, or uh, four eighth notes, 
or two quarter notes. All of these things add up together to be one half note. 10 uh, of, of the fives, right? 10 quintuplet notes, single quintuplet notes. Or 12 sextuplets. That's, that would cover two half notes too, right? So there's all these options. And so what we're talking about here is creating what's called a roll bass or a roll meter. And this is we're understanding what rhythm am I playing underneath that written rhythm that's making the roll happen. And this allows me to not get lost. Because so often concert percussionists, they're really great at playing the rhythm and keeping time. And they get to the roll and they go for a coffee, right? We so often, we, we forget to, to subdivide, continue to subdivide, to stay right in touch. So it's really easy sometimes to get out early and then you can yank the ensemble in the wrong direction. Or you can get out late and then you're playing catch up after that to try to get back with everybody. So really knowing how many strokes you're playing in a roll, knowing what that roll base is or that roll meter is, matters a lot, okay? So this is dependent on a couple of things. I have my half note. So if my half note is this, ba, I could play 16th notes there, okay? I could play eighth note triplets. I could play eighth notes, okay? Those are my three options. Let's just stick with those three options for now. So if I have those three options, now I'm going to play a multiple bounce stroke on every single one of those notes. That's what's going to give me the roll. So here's my 16th notes. Here it is buzzed to realize the roll. Okay. Now I want to try to get away from actually hearing the rhythm of the 16th notes. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear that kind of a sound. So I want to make sure that it's a nice, sustained, continuous sound. But in my head, I know I'm playing 16th notes. And then I can get out in the right spot. Okay? So that's one way of doing it. Now, I can play those triplets. Okay? If I buzz those triplets, it sounds like this. A little bit more open. Okay? So now we're talking about roll density. That's a little bit more open. It's a little less dense, a little less closed. Okay? A little bit more breath in the sound. Also works as a roll, sustained sound. So depending on the sound and the color you're going for, either of those is going to work. I could play eighth notes, but watch out here. Buzzed. Yeah. It's not working, right? Now this is not a sustained, continuous sound. So at some point, now I got to go the other, I could try the other direction. So after 16 notes, I got fives. University, university one. I could buzz that. Okay, you can hear there's more and more uh, sort of uh, anxiety building up in the roll. You can hear there's more and more energy built into that. I could try sixes. And eventually the roll gets so dense that it's too crushed, right? That I'm pushing too much into the head. The sticks don't have that free rebound that we were talking about earlier, regardless of whether I'm playing seven or eight rebounds or three rebounds, there's not the breath of sound coming out of the drum to hear the body of the drum, okay? And so I need to pick an optimal meter that makes sense so that it still sounds like a roll, but that I don't get lost. And that's really important. So this is dependent on, on one thing, right? Which is, which is the tempo. And this is why I call it metering. Some people call this measured. And I don't agree. I don't think it's measured. To me, I think measured is completely reserved for double stroke rolls. I will not get into that right now unless somebody wants me to, but just for the sake of not confusing folks. But measured for me is double stroke open rolls. Metered is closed rolls, okay, concert rolls. So if I'm metering this roll, I'm going to choose my roll meter to be 16th notes, okay? Great. I got a roll meter of 16th notes. Amazing. There's an outside factor that can change that, okay? Just like a thermometer has an outside factor that makes the mercury go, well, it's not mercury anymore, I guess, <laughs> whatever it is that's in thermometers now, right? Makes it go up and down, and that's the temperature. A thermometer goes up or down depending on the outside factor, which is the temperature. And your roll meter might go up or down. It might change, 16th notes, fives, threes, but it might change depending on the tempo. Because 16th notes at the half note here, Ba works. What if my half note is this? Ba. So 
So my 16th notes are Now I gotta roll that, buzz it. Nope, that's not a smooth, sustained, continuous sound. I gotta get a more dense roll. So I might be thinking about fives or sixes, right? Buzz that. Yeah, now we're talking. So my roll meter, when the tempo goes down, becomes more strokes, right? And I think that inverse relationship makes sense. If I have more time to fill up, I got to buzz more notes to make a smooth, continuous, sustained sound. If I have less time to fill up, like we're in cut time and the music's blowing by, my roll meter might be eighth notes, right? And I might be able to just rip through that as we go. So I think that's also a really helpful tool in understanding how it is that we approach this, especially if you work with, you know, younger musicians, intermediate, beginner musicians, or you are one of those musicians and you find yourself like, ah, you know, I'm, I'm there and I'm get it. I get in in the right spot and then sometimes I get out and it's not in the right spot. Knowing where you are and keeping that subdivision going is really important. But I will, I will add that getting rid of that, the pul what we call pulsing the roll in that rhythm is also not good, right? We don't want to have a roll that sounds like 16th notes just buzzed. Want to try for that smooth, continuous sound. You can, you can get that out of your playing by just really thinking about evening up your hands. And often, sometimes, as you sort of work through this and you get more comfortable with it, you get more advanced, you start to choose numbers that are less recognizable for people on a regular basis. So five and seven are a little less hard, or a little, uh, a little more challenging for folks to detect rhythmically underneath the roll than, say, four or six or two or something like that. Okay? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about roll meters. I did want to go back and mention one other thing, which is that uh, going, thinking about the density of the buzz strokes. And when we talked about one and two and three and four and five and six from, from each hand. Okay. There's a wonderful video online uh, from, from Josh Jones, a fantastic young percussionist, Kansas City Symphony. Um, he is an incredible musician and he's got a video, a really quick video, I think it's a Black Swan video. Um, that talks a little bit about um, how he makes these kinds of roles happen. So he works with a little bit of this, this uh, notion, and he, he basically eventually gets to a point where he's playing lopsided. So he'll be rebounding four in the right hand and maybe three in the left hand, and it sounds like he's you know, playing in 716. He's an incredible musician, incredible control of the syndrome sticks. So if you're looking for a little bit more of, of an understanding of, of going in that direction in terms of controlling the, the rebounds, the stroke density of the multiple bounce, then that's a great video to check out. Wonderful musician as well. Cool. Just going to check in on some questions. Seeing some things come in here. I think a little bit about metering. So, all right. Yeah, cool. So I see a question here from Sue about metering is so important. Does the type and length of stick used impact this? Do you prefer wood, for example, hickory, snare drum sticks, or example, Vic Firth SD1 with wood tips, or do you, you ever use nylon tips, et cetera? Yeah, great question. So um, I, yeah, the type of stick makes a big difference for me depending on how it feels. Um, I think the factors here would definitely be the shape of the tip and the length of the taper, which is how long it takes for the stick to get from thick to thin, yeah? So uh, for me, I basically use, I mean, the Vic Firth SD1s are kind of the go-to snare drum stick. Everybody should have a pair of those in their bag. Concert snare drum sticks, folks, they're, they're thicker, right? Uh, than, I would say than most drum set sticks. I shouldn't say all, but uh, the taper is often uh, typically a little bit long, uh, shorter, excuse me. So, uh, and then also I would say that you, the tips are a little bit beefier and often they're rounded. So just, just make sure that you're looking for a stick that's, that's designed for concert playing. Um, the balance in them too is in a different spot, I would argue. So for me, it's always wood. Vic Firth SD1s for sure. Another Vic Firth line that's good are the, are the uh, Ted Atkatz signature sticks, sticks and the, the, the Tim Jennis signature sticks too. I like those sticks. Um, they kind of have a teardrop bead and, and that's a really nice shape for getting, if you have to play rolls and articulate passages to have a teardrop bead, you get the contact of the teardrop 
the bulbous part for the contact for the length of the rolls. And then because it teardrops and you have that tip that's a little bit more pointed, it's able to capture a little bit more of that articulation when you have to play clearly. Really my go-to folks are the Cooperman folks. Um, Cooperman makes fantastic sticks. These are Graham C. John's ones, kind of the, the equivalent to SD ones, but I would say, uh, you know, much, much better crafted, um, much better weighted. Um, I haven't ordered a pair of Cooperman's in a long time, but you used to be able to choose your weight of stick. So I have a couple of pairs of Rosewood sticks from Cooperman and they're actually quite heavy. Um, and then, you know, you see there's lots of different options there. Um, so the Mike Rosen fives are also a really great stick. That's got a, a, a tip that's a, quite a long uh, tip, but really and a long taper on those sticks as well. So definitely wood. Um, yeah, Vic Frith is good. I love the Cooperman stuff. Um, so for me, I think those are the, the ones that I go to most. And I just have a variety of different tips and tapers and weights. And that's kind of how I think about that. Uh, question I saw here about choosing... Yeah, so this is a question from, it looks like Beaker Arc. So for a concert percussionist, how do you choose your particular instruments for the venue you're playing in? Are there tips you can impart to us? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say that, <laughs> okay, there's a couple of things I could, I could get to here. So the first is that um, if they're providing the instruments for you, great because <laughs> then you don't have to pack up your van and haul all your stuff there um sometimes you know you definitely want to ask questions about what that gear is and where it's from um but yeah in and and what its condition it's in um so basically my rule of thumb is this if it's portable for me i'm bringing it no matter what like there's no way i'm not taking my pearl snare drums to play I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna leave it to chance. It's very easy for me to carry in one, two, four snare drums to, to any kind of gig. So I'm gonna bring my snare drums. Anything that's portable, I'm gonna bring. Absolutely. Okay. Um, after that, like when we're talking about larger instruments, marimba, vibraphone, xylophone, timpani, chimes, bass drum, then we're talking about, you know, what condition is it in? What, what is it? How big is it? What are the dimensions? All of these things matter, I think. What your question, I think, is specific to venues. And I think what I can say about that is that it's maybe not so much about venue than it is about what the genre, the setting of the show is. Um, so, you know, we I do play in the behind the rock band in the rock symphony. And so sometimes we we're looking for instruments, frankly, that that's all mic'd. So we don't necessarily, even though you might think we have to worry about volume, we don't. It's all mic'd. Um, and so what we're looking for there is just making sure that it's coming across clear, that it's got a great sound, which is the hallmark of anything. It's got to have, you got to have a great sound. Um, but, you know, I think, I think my point is that um, folks might think that the venue or the, or the, the, the style of show might in influence it, but really it boils down to what it sounds like. What do you want it to sound like? And I think it, this boils down to you know, artistic integrity too. So you got you know, your congas and you're like, these are my awesome Pearl Elite congas over here. They're, they sound huge. I love them. I know exactly how to play them. I know exactly how to get slap. I know exactly how to get open. I know how to get bass. I know how to get all these things out of them. They're my instrument. They're my voice. You show up to the gig and you're like, here, I'm here with my instrument. And my experience is that all the sound technicians are wonderful at all these venues that I've worked at, mostly in saying, okay, great, let's work together and figure out how we can make that sound great. So I would say I don't tend to choose instruments too much unless it's at the request of the, uh, like the director or the conductor. Um, I, a couple of my, uh, one of my colleagues I teach with here at the university has been playing in the pit orchestra of the Stratford Festival for a very long time here in the theater. Um, Dave Campion is a wonderful human one of the nicest guys you will ever meet. Um, and he's an incredible musician. And so, you know, he, I've subbed for him a little bit in the theater. And so when you're subbing, you don't get to choose the instruments at all. They all stay. But sometimes he'll make really important choices that might help to, to support the storyline, right, in the theater. And they're making really intentional choices there about, you know, what kind of sound is going to support this story as best as we can. And so, yeah, there's, there's definitely some factors there. But I think... 
um, you know, you're developing your own voice as a percussionist. And often people want you to come because they 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 like the way you sound. And they want you to come and play. So you come and you bring your instruments. And typically, I would say um, it's rare that I would show up and make a choice, or that I would make a specific choice based on the venue. Definitely, maybe on the genre of the kind of show, but mostly I show up with my gear and I've worked on making it sound the way I wanted to, and we try to get that out to the audience as best we can. So, yeah, cool. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, yeah, just one last reminder, I guess, to uh, email Connolly at long mcquadecom uh, to enter the draw for a free Pearl T-shirt. Those, those Pearl T-shirts are awesome, by the way. I have one. They're pretty great. And I'm just noticing here... Yeah, just uh, a question here from Randy. Cool, Randy. So it says, can you please show how to practice push slash pull or finger control techniques? Yeah, let's try to talk about that briefly. That makes sense. So for me, I think what, what, what you're talking about is how am I going to use my engage my fingers to help me do the thing that I need to do, right? So my main stroke is gonna come from my wrist. But if I need to play more quickly, I might need to use the back, my back fingers to pull up. A lot of that has to do with the way you grip the sticks. If your fundamental default grip of the sticks has your fingers off of the sticks, they are not gonna be available to you when you need to use them. So if that's true for you, then you, you need to seriously think about reconsidering how you hold the sticks because you need those fingers available to you if you're going to use them to pull a little bit. So that finger pull technique is, allows me to get a little bit more speed out of my stroke. So let's see if I can just... So I'm just pulling up with my back fingers as quickly as I can here. Um, I, I work through... In terms of exercises, uh, I worked through a series of exercises in stick control. Uh, George Lawrence Stone, you know, one of the, basically what most people refer to as the Bible of snare drumming. Basically all these different combinations and exercises for snare drum. I use the first three pages and I have a series of, of exercises I do on those called the stick control variations that were passed down to me uh, through my lineage of, of learning um, from my teacher, Jill Ball. Uh, and back, this dates back to her teacher, Robert Honer at Central Michigan University. And these stick control variations just kind of evolved as like a workout, a warm up for, for snare drum playing and for stick control. And so it's basically just the first three pages, but there's all sorts of different variations you can use on these first three pages. So one of them is just called, um, one of them is called vamp. I'll walk you through this really quickly. So one of them is called vamp. You basically, you play the, the each line of stick control, but in between each line, you play that length of the line again, but all of the notes with the hand that the line ended with. So the first line of stick control, the first page is, it's alternating right, left, right, left, followed by right, left, right, left, et cetera, et cetera. So it sounds like this. That's the first line. And then I play all that again, but I ended with left. So I'm gonna play all that with left. Now the second line starts left and alternates left, right. So now I'm on left, right. And that line ended with right, so I'm gonna vamp a line of right before I move on to line three. Et cetera, et cetera. Line three is right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left. So I'm gonna continue. I ended left, so I play a line of left. Line four is left, left, right, right. So I play that. And I vamp right, a line of right. Line five is the paradiddle, the right paradiddle, or the, sorry, the paradiddle, so. And then I end left, so I vamp left. Et cetera, et cetera. So I basically play the lines, and then I vamp in between. So that ends up being... 16 notes vamped in one hand in between each one of those. And then I'm going to push the tempo as I stay relaxed. I stay comfortable. I stay with my grip. I stay with my posture. I don't, I don't want to feel any tension. I want to slowly move a great metronome technique up four, down two. I love this trick. I taught to me by a, a good friend of mine, flute player, Kevin O'Donnell here in town, a, 
up four, down two. It's amazing. You know, you start at 80. The next tempo, you go to 84. Once you can do 84, you do 82. It settles you down a little bit. You lock it in. Then from there, you can go to 86. And your up four, down two is amazing. It's really, really helpful. It allows you to settle it settle it in before you try to, to push yourself again. So eventually when you work that up, right, you can, you have to kick your fingers in. So I'm just trying to just stay relaxed. I'm trying to pull up and all of that comes into making sure that my fingers are on the stick and that my rebound is not coming too high off the drum, but I'm letting my fingers control it. When I play the multiple bounce stroke too, I need to use my fingers a little bit and add some pressure at that fulcrum with my middle finger, okay? One of the things that I think is really important about figuring out how to get that relaxed multiple bounce stroke is making sure that you know how much, exactly how much pressure you need between your thumb and your index finger and maybe a little bit of your middle finger as well. And you do that by squeezing to make those rebounds happen, right? I can't, I can get the long one without any pressure, but as soon as I start to, as soon as I start to try to get four or three, I need to throw it and squeeze a little bit, okay? The problem is nobody can teach you that. Nobody can say, hey, you need to squeeze like 33 pounds per square inch of pressure <laughs> between your thumb and index finger in order to get exactly the right number of strokes. So. A great exercise that I do with my students is you squeeze, I get them to squeeze really tight, so it's tight that the thing doesn't rebound, and you play strokes. And nothing rebounds. And you gradually loosen your, your grip at your fulcrum, gradually and gradually, until eventually you drop the stick. Most of them don't want to drop it, but you like this. Eventually, I drop the stick. And then at some point now, I've set the spectrum. I have as tight as I can possibly be and as loose as I can possibly be. And in there somewhere is the right amount of pressure for me on my fulcrum. So then I go back and I try to figure out what that is. Okay, but even, even using your thumb and your index to squeeze and pulling up a little bit with your middle finger is what helps to give you that uh, multiple bounce rebound, that multiple bounce stroke where those buzzes are a little bit closer together. Cool. All right, well, I th we, we may have made it here. I think this is great. This has been super fun, everybody. I really appreciate your engagement on the chat. I have to be honest with you. I, I, um, you know, I would have, I love to see your faces. Live stream is awesome. At the same time, it's, it's, it's a, a bit goofy because I just hear you in the chat. Um, but I really appreciate you sending these questions in. It's really helped me get a sense of what it is that you're interested in and try my best to answer your questions, to tailor some of this content for you. Um, but I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm really hopeful that it was helpful for you tonight. Um, so just one last reminder, if you want a last crack at getting a t-shirt, email uh, Connolly at long mcquadecom to enter the draw for a free per Pearl t-shirt. Um, and just before we wrap up, a, a couple of thank yous. I do want to thank one more time uh, Sean LaFrenz and Mark Tarek at Pearl Adams Drums and Concert Percussion for sponsoring the event tonight. Um, you guys are the best. It's been a while since I've seen you, obviously. Um, but really appreciate your support, uh, your ongoing support, uh, your long-term support, and just, you know, for all this gear and everything that you do, really, really appreciate you guys. And, and thanks for, uh, for helping... Uh, you know, out with the, with the event, but also like helping acquire such such wonderful sounding instruments and, and for for um, producing and distributing such great instruments. It's really really awesome stuff. So, um, you know, some of the Adams keyboard instruments, you guys, you have to check out some of these Alpha instruments. The you know, if we had another session, we could totally talk about the marimba and the xylophone and the but the keyboards just sound incredible coming out of Holland. They're they're fantastic. So. Big thanks to Sean and Mark. And just to the crew at Long and McQuaid, all of you that have been involved in this, uh, you know, setting this up, I really appreciate your help and your support to Adam, to Matt, uh, you know, to Jim and to Sherry. I appreciate just the connecting with you over email, getting this set up, working together to, to put this on tonight. Um, really, really helpful. Um, you know, best wishes to all of you. Uh, this is a crazy time. All I can say is, um, you know, stay healthy. Take care of yourselves. Hug the ones you love uh, the most tight every night. And uh, yeah, 
I wish you all the best. Uh, work hard. Please don't uh, hesitate at all to get in touch with me. You can always email me, bconnolly at wlu.ca. Would love to support you. Would love to connect with you. And, uh, yeah, hopefully this was helpful. Good luck practicing. Uh, thanks to Matt. And uh, we're going to have a great night. Stay safe, everybody. And we'll hopefully see you again soon.